Welcome back. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jonathan Fisher. Whether building or rebuilding an outbound sales division, one of the most expensive aspects of doing so is the time involved. Well, today's guests are about to save you a lot of time, big time, in that project. Michael Basson and Daniel Schwartz are two highly successful entrepreneurs who have a reputation for unifying people from highly diverse cultural backgrounds to achieve great things. Among other accomplishments, the two have built a consulting firm called Scale Up Sales, which has an amazing track record of helping businesses build outbound sales strategies that work fast. We're talking from zero to full speed in just a couple of weeks. In our conversation today, you will learn exactly how you can do the very same thing for your company. And uh, Michael and Dan, what a pleasure to have you on the show today. Welcome. Thanks so much. Thanks. It's great to be here. So it's a great topic. Before we jump in, I wonder if I could ask you guys, how did you come by the insights you're going to be sharing with the listener today? We came, we came through all these different insights by doing this ourselves a lot of different times. Both Daniel and I were the first sales hires at a couple of different uh, technology startups. We were basically expected to build out these processes fast in very much a sink or swing type of, type of way. And since we started Scale Up Sales, we've helped over 50 companies build out their outbound sales processes in a way that's quick, efficient, and also in a way that's able to balance out the science and the art required, to, required for success. You know, Jonathan, I can also tell you, just kind of jumping in on that, um, you know, Mike, like Mike, Mike said, uh, we've been sales leaders at a bunch of different uh, tech companies. But I, I actually remember the moment Mike and I were, um, when we first met, we actually met at a, at a company we were working in the ad tech space. And uh, we were basically building the entire company, the entire growth of the company based off of outbound uh, processes. And we had a moment where we were sitting there like, why is this so hard? Why, doesn't, why can't we just send emails? Why doesn't this work? Why, why can't we just you know, message as many people as we want. And that's when we sort of started digging into this black box and sort of discovering the process that's actually involved in successfully managing an uh, outbound uh, um, strategy at scale. So it, it really kind of the genesis of it all really starts with just him and me banging our heads against a wall and not, getting, not understanding why we're not getting into people's inboxes. Uh, and so once we kind of realized that there was a necessity there uh, for companies to grow that way, um, we started basically building into a service. And that's kind of how it all came to be. Well, I love that. Well, you know, the those those real world experiences are the very best ones for teaching us what works. And uh, it seems like it's a moving target. I mean, it's, it's not like you can do the same things today that you did even just a couple, three uh, years ago in Outbound. Um, and, and still before we kind of jump in, I'm wondering, why is it important in your mind, gentlemen, to move quickly on this? Where our, our promise to the listener is we can do this in just a couple of weeks. Uh, why does that matter? That's such a good question. Maybe I'll start with Mike and then you'll follow up on this one because you took the last one. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. First of all, it's totally a moving target. I mean, that's one of the biggest challenges. So when you think about it, you're, one of your biggest, if you're trying to do an outbound um, lead generation campaign at, at scale, one of your biggest challenges is the actual email clients themselves. So that's like Google and Microsoft. They basically are the two biggest ones. And all their algorithms around spam and delivery and all those things are completely concealed. It's a black box. So, and they're always changing them. Uh, so you, you, you always have to be on your toes, always sort of poking those boundaries and discovering what's, what you can do, what you can't do, functioning within those guidelines that'll actually allow you to have good deliverability and get into people's inboxes. The most challenging thing, I think the biggest pitfall when it comes to running an outbound campaign at scale, and Mike, feel free to disagree with me, is just getting into someone's inbox in the first place and then making sure the messaging that you're getting in front of them is fantastic. But, but that first step is, is something that definitely requires you to be on your toes and constantly paying attention to changes that are happening in those algorithms and making sure that you're able to hit people's inboxes and not just end up in, in spam. The reason this is so well, it, it's a bit of a cat and a mouse, isn't it, with all the different changes in technology to kind of stop you from doing your job as a as a business development leader, correct? Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of the, the biggest reason to do this fast is because your, your competitors, first of all, are doing it really fast. Um, outbound uh, sales outreach through cold email, LinkedIn, and cold calling is by far the most cost effective. B2B marketing channel. And also because when, you're, when, you, when you know you can get people's attention through outbound messaging, that forms the backbone of all of the rest of the content marketing and messaging you're going to have for your entire growth as a company. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense too. And I mean, obviously, uh, a really well designed business development strategy is going to have multiple channels, not just outbounds, but it's, it's, it's a super powerful one for sure. Well, we're about to jump in and get into the uh, the meat and potatoes here, listener. But we don't want to remind you, especially our LinkedIn audience, uh, don't be bashful. We want to hear your questions. Post those in chat right away as soon as they occur to you. We're going to bank those, and at the bottom of the half hour, we'll circle back, get you some live answers right here with our expert guests. All right, so guys, well, let's jump in. I'm, I'm, I'm your guy, let's say. I'm your founder, and I want to get this thing rocking. What are my basic steps? Someone lead off. Get us started. Sure. I'm happy to get us started, okay? Uh, when you think about what is required to get outbound working for you two weeks or less, it's about consolidating a number of different totally uh, separate processes uh, on an ongoing basis. Uh, there's creating really great content, particularly for email, LinkedIn, and cold calling. There's uh, con there's getting a highly targeted a, tar a list of targeted leads. There's managing all the technical aspects behind sending out your campaigns through uh, email automation, LinkedIn automation, and cold calling. And there's all the process management. The first thing I'm going to talk about has to do with how do you get your story straight? How do you make sure you have really great copy for email, LinkedIn, and cold calling that's actually going to convert? The first thing that you need to do if you're going to create really good short messages that are going to get people's attention is to write out your messaging and write out your entire story of what you're selling in long form in as long expository form as you can in the form of a sales pitch. This is essentially where you're coming up with your own business case because writing long content is actually easier than writing short content. And if you don't totally know how, what you want to say or how you can get it in a really condensed way, writing out in long form is really great because once you have it in long form, then you're able to then pepper it uh, pepper out that content in short form throughout your email campaigns, LinkedIn campaigns, and your cold calling messaging. Um, I'm actually going to share my screen and to show you kind of an example of what I'm talking about here. Okay. Uh, let me see real quick. I'm going to share my screen. This is my first time doing it. Uh, okay. Can you see my screen? Okay. Uh, the first thing that I recommend if you want to create a really great email sequence or have just a pitch for cold calling is to create a pitch where you're basically thinking about how your messaging can impact the client and what information you need to assume about them in as expository form as possible. So this includes basically thinking really thoroughly about what kinds of questions, information do you need from a potential prospect? Writing out your introduction about who you are and what makes you very specific, what makes you very special. Uh, talking about the problem in, in really great depth. You know, what is the problem you're solving? And why should someone care? How are, you, how are you potentially helping them? What is your solution? Having all of this content in long form will make the entire creative process going forward, creating, banging out some amazing content for your campaigns, very, 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 very easy and much less time consuming. Once you have this, you obviously want to create your campaigns. When you think about what your message should be with a cold email, cold LinkedIn message, or a cold call, you know, you have to consider what is your prospect going to understand. No matter how complex your solution is, from technologically, who you're talking to, you have to be as much as possible, make your language such that a small child or a very elderly person can understand you. And the best way to, to do that is also to consider what is the easiest way I can ensure that someone does what I want, which is usually book a meeting. So what I'm actually sharing right now is our top, our, stru our structure for creating really high performing outbound content, whereby when we create a, a messaging sequence, we're trying to make it as easy as possible for someone to book a meeting, to actually know what we want, which is why we build our, we build our messaging out to think as if someone's reading it like they're looking at a CV, a resume of someone they might be willing to hire. Just like when you look at a resume and you take one second, three seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds to decide if you're going to call that person in for an interview, it's the same with your outbound messaging. So when you're, when you're considering your messaging, the depth of your solution, the differentiation should always be at the bottom half of the message and the top half of the message or the initial, your initial lead should always be a brief introduction, a very clear one or two sentences about your explanation and why you can help them with a quick call to action. Now, when you, when you send messaging out and you talk like this, you uh, make it very clear what you want. It's a very clear snippet of what, you're, what value you're able to offer. And then all the other remaining details 
that you might that might make you unique. They might not read it word for word or hear it word for word, but they're going to be impressed who sent it and are more likely to book a meeting. And because I think the key when it comes to differentiating your messaging is not trying to go super short, not trying to just, you know, hook someone on a call or con them into getting on a meeting with you without really knowing what they're getting into. It's about balancing out their short attention span with getting the max amount of information. So when you're talking about having a message that can get a, a quick call to action like that, um, how, how are we implementing this? Are we using old school cold calling? Is this email marketing? Is it a combination of different channels, omnichannel approach? Uh, how do you, how do you deploy tech, uh, tactically? Dan, do you want to refer, do you want to yeah, answer? Absolutely. And, 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 uh, I think Jonathan, the, the short answer is yes. Um, <laughs> for, I was saying, I always love it when Mike talks about, uh, how to construct a proper, uh, sales pisser messaging. Uh, he's one of the strongest people I know in it. Um, and, and it's brilliant. And, so yeah, Jonathan, when you look at like what Michael's talking about, building this whole script, who are we as a business and what is our angle? What is our what is our pitch sort of? Um, having a unified language across all the different channels you're going to be approaching is 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 key to, to creating your brand identity and is also key to sort of driving interest in your business and making sure that you have a clear and concise message. So by starting with that full who, you know, the whole sales pitch, everything we do and why it matters as your sort of core source, you're going to be able to leverage that for creating messaging for your cold calling, for your LinkedIn, uh, and for your email. So it kind of goes across the entire board, which is why it's great to sort of brainstorm the whole thing to start with. The other thing I'm going to add here is when you're considering the way you're writing the messaging, I think it's really important to think about it from the perspective of the person you're writing to. You should always be writing value to your perspective, your perspective client. Um, I use this example so many times, and I know Mike. If you, if you want to, you know, sleep for the next uh, two minutes, Mike, feel free to. Um, but I think one of the best sales pitches of all time uh, was 2007 when Steve Jobs introduces the iPhone. He's got a, a new device that people don't know about, and it's pretty cool. And he goes on stage, and so I think I think the presentation is 13 minutes long. Um, for the first five minutes, if I remember correctly, uh, he doesn't tell you that it's one device. He tells you what it does. It's an internet communicator, it's a phone, it's a, your iPod, I think your music, everything that the iPhone does. And then for the first next eight minutes, right, the total eight minutes, he doesn't even show you what the device looks like. So even by the time you've discovered what the device is and that it's a single device, you still don't know what it looks like because he's harping on the core value of what the device is for the user. And by the time he actually presents the device, you already understand why you should care about it. And the same is really true when you're creating messaging, especially when it's short messaging, like you're gonna have on a cold call or an email or LinkedIn. Think about why the person on the other end who's reading it cares. What's the value that's coming to them? It's really easy when we create a service or a product or a SaaS company, we put a lot of work and energy into the thing we want to talk about ourselves because we're proud of what we've done, but nobody cares about us. Nobody cares about you. Nobody cares about your product. Nobody, right? What they care about is what it will do for them. And so when you're writing that messaging and when you're writing that sort of who we are as a company out and then starting to create those more specific messagings for email, LinkedIn, etc., always be thinking of it for the lens of what is the value I'm providing to the person who's reading this? And we can talk about my product along the way, but like, what's the core value I'm bringing you? Mm -hmm. Jonathan, can I add something? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Go ahead. The other thing that needs to be done when it comes to creating this difference in messaging and leading with value is almost doing a psychological breakdown and who you're writing to. There's not a one size fits all way of writing all emails necessarily. Okay. Because how I might approach a technical buyer, a CTO of a company, a software developer is totally different from someone who's a salesperson or a CEO. You know, technical people don't like being cold outreached as much, you know? Whereas if you're a revenue generating, uh, you're in a revenue generating position like a CEO or a salesperson, you might be much more open because if a solution can help you, you know, develop, you know, generate more revenue, you wanna hear more about that. So whether you're gonna take a, an informative approach, uh, a conversational approach, an I feel your pain approach, getting a feedback approach, these are all things that need to be happen in advance of even putting pen to paper with writing one email. The writing of the email process or writing the cold call pitch or LinkedIn messaging templates, that should be very fast. 
once you have your outline and your pitch and all these different points in your psychological profile, everything else should be smooth sailing. This is such a solid point. Um, people usually think about, I'm just going to write one email and then spam my entire ICD, my entire ideal customer profile, everyone I'm reaching out to, right? But Mike, you're 100% right, man. It's all about who am I writing to and making sure that if I'm writing to, you know, CEOs, C, you know, uh, VPs of sales and heads of marketing, each one of those might need a whole different email campaign for them. And so I'm not just writing one email campaign for everybody. I'm writing a campaign to fit every single profile of person I'm looking to touch. It's huge. Well, and yeah, that is huge. It sounds like it's a, um, a, a, a unique task that requires devoted attention, right? I mean, how, how do you do that? Can you still kind of segment out your audience like a marketer or do you need to go one by one by one? Like what do you recommend on that front? Uh, I think that it's not scalable or practical or, or time effective to really do things one by one by one, unless you're trying to, uh, you know, arrange a bunch of meetings for a business trip or a conference where you're reaching out to a, a very small list. You know, we're talking about trying to build an outbound sales operation at scale. So I think what you need to do is you need to go along a list of assumptions. And one of the challenges with cold outreach in general, with cold calling, cold email, and cold LinkedIn is that you don't totally know exactly what's going on on their side. There are some indicators. You can look at people's LinkedIn profiles. What kind of content are they promoting? Does the company have a blog? Are they issuing press releases? But most of the time, if you're if you're an expert in what you do and whatever solution you're providing, you've got a uh, you you. It's your job to know as, as quickly as possible what you think their pain point is. And the way that you uh, are able to test out whether you're right about that pain point is by having messaging that's super easy to respond to. If you don't have messaging that's easy to respond to, you're going to be driving in the wrong direction for a long time because you don't know if people are not responding to you because you're you're wrong about your 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 assumptions or if your messaging just sucks. So uh, you have to make some assumptions. I don't recommend testing out too many different kinds of messaging because you have to have enough data in order to, to make assumptions. You know, generally speaking, I would, I would always advise that you've, you've got to test out your messaging on at least a couple hundred individual prospects to be able to make any conclusions. 20 is not enough. It could work for 20. It could not work for 20. And, um, you know, it's up to you to come up with an initial hypothesis and then test it out by having really great language. And it's really best not to skimp that out and to, to uh, send it to friends, family, colleagues to say, do you understand this? And if you really are in a crunch, you really have no idea if what you're saying is being understood, honestly, have your child read it or your grandma or someone else's grandma, because if they get it, you're sitting on a gold mine. I like that. I do think that we can be just a little bit uh, too smart by half, as the saying goes, right, in our marketing and uh, end up losing the impact. So yeah, gra grab your nearest eighth grader, I guess, right? Is a good rule. Yeah. Um, Seven -year -old. I like that a lot. Or what? Seven-year-old. Seven-year-old, even better. <laughs> well, yeah, just because we're in tech, I mean, we have to make it approachable. Uh, I, I'm interested, Michael, and when you say easy to respond to, um, tell me more about that. What, what, what do you mean specifically? What it means is this. A lot of people have uh, want to believe that short emails are always going to be the be better, or short messaging in general is going to be better. Not necessarily. It depends what you're selling and who you're writing to. Long emails can be incredibly effective. You know, we always test out short, medium, long emails. When I say long emails, I'm typically referring to messaging on email that's longer than 160 words. I've seen 300 word emails do fantastically and 100 word emails do terribly. When I, mean, when I, when I refer to making easy to respond to, if you have a really long email with a lot of information just about you and it's all about you know what you can do in your product and all these features, you've got like a very incoherent call to action at the very bottom of it. It's not very easy to respond to because you know saying like, please book some time with me here is not the same thing as asking a question. Having a call to action early on in the email, assuming someone might not read your 300 word email or 150 word email word for word is super valuable because you want to make it easy for them to respond. You can send the information after that, but that's actually why with not every email, we do have emails that are short within a sequence and some that are longer to develop different propositions. But I think it's always good, especially in the earlier uh, messaging to have uh, two calls to action within an email, okay? Or uh, because that way you know you're striking them twice, and it's absolutely crystal clear what you want from them. Are there certain types sure, of call to action quick, quick. that work better than others? I just want to follow up real quick on like so. Oh, yeah, like, go ahead. Two calls to action. You mean two of the same calls to action? 
Not too difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you want a meeting, yeah. then you say, are you available to connect about this next week? Or in the next gotcha. call to action can be, you know, when are you available next week? Are you available on Thursday? Something like that. And, you know, they, I, I think they should generally be the same call to action because you don't want to confuse users. You don't want to have a call to action where you're asking for a meeting in one place and then a different call to action saying, read this white paper or go to this link to like our blog. Well, they're only going to do one because people don't have the attention span. Oftentimes people are reading from their phones. They don't know who you are. And especially if you, you're already estranged, you're already a foreign, you're already like foreign to them. You, you're, you're really trying to come off like a human being on their level, not come off as overly, uh, overly uh, anxious to get in front of their faces. You know, you don't want to send out messaging that says, I've stalked your LinkedIn and all your social media for the past six months, just in anticipation of writing this message. You don't want to come off as too aloof and too overbearing or too much of an expert. You want to be a human, you want to be personable, and you want to make it easy for them to know what you want. Yeah, and, and just kind of a last thought on that, because uh, I know we're getting a little bit time to time. We want to talk about other things in the process, well, I'm sure. Um, but if you think about an email like its core objectives, there are three things you really want to get across the line, right? You want to get who you are, the value you're going to bring to your reader, and what you want them to do. So when talking about like, I want to make an email easy to respond to, it's just like you would do if you were on a sales call, right? The last thing you really want is to make your reader have to think, okay, well, what does this person want from me? Or God forbid, have to choose two different things that you want from them, right? So making it really clear and concise, hey, let's get on a call and talk about how I can bring you value. Or if you want them to read something or whatever your specific goal is, making sure that that's immediately understandable and that no thought is actually required in order to understand what's wanted of the reader, that's, that's critical in terms of making it uh, easy to, uh, to, to, to get your reader to understand what they need to do. Another thing yeah, nice. that's really important, Jonathan, when it comes to making really good outbound campaign content is also identifying a super niche profile. I don't mean niche like 10 people. It can be 1,000 people, 2,000, 5,000 individuals. But the more niche your audience is, the more niche your content's going to be. And that kind of goes into the next aspect, which has to do with lead research. Right on. Well, talk to us about lead research. What does that mean and how do you go about it? Yeah, I can, I can start on that one. So first of all, when you think about messaging at scale, you have a bit of a challenge, right? So we already talked a little bit about this. You're going to need to create sort of the right message for each person you're talking to, and it needs to feel personal, but you can't write to everybody, especially if you're doing it at scale. If you're writing 2,000 you know, new contacts month over month, you can't actually write to every single one of those people, not consistently. So. One of the first things you're going to need to do is consider your ideal customer profile. Who is it that you want to get in front of, right? That's important because you want to make sure that <clears throat> when you're getting on calls, you're getting on the right calls because you're never going to close a deal with the wrong, uh, the wrong lead, right? Hmm. Um, so that's the first thing. Who's your ideal customer, your ideal uh, customer profile or ICP? Once you have that in mind, you're going to want to consider what geographies you want to approach. So do you want to be in the US market, the Latin American market? right? European, are you language specific? Can you, you know, what can your product actually support or your service actually support and who's relevant for you to target? Um, once you've considered that right now, we're building a lead profile, right? So now we're in the process of building a lead profile and that's going to allow us to do research on that profile. So now we're going to consider what type of businesses we're going to be reaching out to, uh, like what industry they might be in. We're going to be thinking about, um, the size of the company, which can be significant, right? Smaller companies tend to close, uh, more quickly, but might be a higher risk of churn or might be a lower uh, AC, a lower annual contract value, right? Lower ACV. Um, so now we're thinking about, about that process, right? Who are my low hanging fruit as well? You know, what, what am I most likely to close soonest? It'll bring me the greatest amount of revenue or sort of that balance point. Hmm. So you're going to sort of go through a process of deciding who those, who those profiles are and what you're going to be reaching out to. Now, once you have that profile, you have something to work with. And then there are a bunch of different tools you can use to achieve your research. At the end, what you're going to need is a leads list, right? You, you, you just want to have a set list of 2,000 leads, 3,000 leads, however many it might be, that you're going to be reaching out to and touching. There are a lot of different platforms that can achieve this. I think the one most cost-effective one is, is going to be like LinkedIn Sales Navigator. Uh, it can be actually enormously effective. Uh, but, you know, Zoom Info, Apollo, Lucia, there are a bunch of different tools that you can use to do that research. You can also get people on... Uh, Upwork or whatever to help you with that. 
But any of those tools, if you just use those leads lists, you're going to run into a big problem. And that big problem is a lot of the emails on those leads lists aren't accurate. Uh, and so you're going to end up basically sending a lot of emails to a lot of bad email addresses. Uh, and we haven't talked about domain health yet, but what that's basically going to do is the more you send to email addresses that aren't real or are outdated, the algorithms that Google and Microsoft have are going to flag your account or your domain specifically as a spammer. And every single message you send from then on will go to people's spam boxes. You won't hit a single inbox. And basically everything you've done, no matter what you, no matter how great your content is, no matter how great your product is, no matter how brilliant you are is worthless because no one's going to see it. Um, so you, you're going to need to use tools to clean uh, those uh, uh, email addresses that you get, those leads lists. There are a bunch of different ones uh, that you can find, um, but you're going to need to clean them uh, get rid of all the bad ones. Uh, and then during the sending process, you actually have to monitor your sending performance for bounce rates to make sure that those are in w within a reasonable uh, reasonable amount. Once you're passing bounce rates of 7 to 10%, once you're getting beyond that, you're getting into dangerous territory. Uh, and the higher that number goes, the faster you're burning your domain's uh, credibility. Uh, you're going to find yourself in trouble. So there are multiple stages to creating that targeted list. Again, just in short, creating that profile, um, doing the research itself, and then cleaning that research list, and then making sure you're monitoring the outreach to 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 see how your bounce rates looks like and look like, and make sure you're you're running clean. Yeah. Are there uh, ways you can ensure the safety of your domain? For example, have some other domains to use for testing campaigns that might be something close, hyphenate your name or something along that line. Does that work? Do you recommend that? Yeah. So here's the kind of the inevitable uh, the inevitable truth. Any domain that you use to send at scale will burn out at some point. Mm -hmm. So the workaround there is you need multiple domains. In fact, every single email address you're going to be using is going to need uh, its own domain. That's actually touching base on sort of like uh, our next point in the process that Michael brought up, which is, which is email addresses. You're going to need multiple email addresses to send at scale. Um, and each of those email addresses needs to be tied to a domain or a subdomain. Uh, and you also need tools to warm those emails up so that they have sort of natural human behavior and they don't get flagged as spam out the gate. Um, so, so yeah, you're going to need multiple email addresses, you're going to need multiple domains, and you're going to want to make sure that you're not actually using your own company's domain for any of your sending uh, because you mm -hmm. obviously don't want to injure your own company's domain. That makes a lot of sense. Well, we have burned through our time together already. And we've just, I think everyone uh, listening is like, okay, what else? <laughs> so yeah, maybe the best way to give the listener, yeah. yeah, maybe the best way to give the listener what else is to tell them where they can find you guys. Cause I, I, I think you've, you've impressed us that you know what you're talking about. What, uh, what are the best ways for people to proceed from here? The best way they can do it is we've got actually a learn section on our website. We have a section where you can basically, we have art, we have in-depth articles, about all these different topics uh, at scaleupsales.com slash learn. So you can see that. We also have a very, very active blog where we have dozens, I think it's probably hundreds of articles now about each of these different topics, but the shorter, more condensed version is definitely uh, the blog. Next week, we're actually going to be coming out with a very in-depth uh, in white paper, which is basically the complete guide to cold email. So when that's ready next week, if people want to send messages through our website or contact us, on LinkedIn, we can add them to the distribution list. We're going to send them the complete guide. It's not the complete guide to cold calling yet, but we'll have that out soon. Uh, you can't win them all in every single uh, document. And, you know, I think the biggest thing to know is that, you know, doing this type of uh, doing sales outreach is not the skill set of any one person. You need a lot of different types of skills. You've got a lot of different types of teams. It mm -hmm. can be very, very time consuming, but there is a way forward. Unfortunately, it's not something you just set up once and let it run. It's kind of like driving and navigating traffic. It needs to constantly be monitored and constantly uh, be, be looked after. So if anybody's interested in, in uh, a complimentary consultation on whatever they're dealing with and want some help, we're happy to also jump on a call with them to, to help them guide them through the process. All right. Well, that's fantastic. And of course, we'll put the, uh, the, the, those URLs in the show notes also. Well, uh, what a great conversation it's been. Now let's get into sort of the afterglow. We, uh, we definitely have some nice questions from our live audience here. Uh, let's dig into some of these 
And let's see, I had one from Rashida Bay. I thought I like this question because it's uh, it kind of it it's kind of turns the tables a little bit. Rashida Rashida is asking, as an outbound expert, what's a, a pet peeve that you have about outbound messages that you personally receive? Who wants to take that one? Uh, oh, I'm dying to jump in on this first, dude. I'm dying. I, I, I gotta go first, Mike. Come on, man. Find you. I don't care. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So that, that's that's a great question. I think Michael and I could probably help come like a whole list of of pet peeves. That we deal with, but I think one of the one of the ones that gets me the most is when uh, when I open an email, I have no clue what what someone's product is going to bring for me. You, you get these emails where somebody's just really pushing to hop on a call or, or wants you to do something for them, but they haven't even told you what they're going to do for you. I, I absolutely that that is like the fastest archive message uh, that there is for me. Like if I if I don't understand what you what what value you're going to bring me in the first you know three sentences, this this conversation is over. That's one that annoys me. The other one is uh, sometimes you get people who, who really just start going technical and talking about their product. And again, mm -hmm. if I don't know the value you're bringing me, I don't know why I'm supposed to care. Uh, yeah. I think those are my two my two biggest pet peeves, but definitely the one where uh, I have no clue what value you're bringing me, like that that first one, that's just the worst. Yeah. It just I, feels I, I bad. Resonate with that for sure. I have totally different pet peeves. <laughs> yeah, go my, ahead, Michael. My, my pet peeves are as follows. When you start off your cold email saying, I know your time is precious, and this is only going to take a minute. Automatically, yeah, I you as a loser. You're a loser. You put yourself <laughs> beneath me. You made <laughs> my time more valuable than you. You're groveling to me to get my attention, and now I just don't respect you. The second thing is when you've stalked me and made your email way too customized. People have a people talk about not wanting to write generic emails. I totally get that. The yeah. customization your your outbound messaging should have to do with your profile, not necessarily too much about the individual. If you've started an email to me saying, I read your blog from six months ago and I've seen your LinkedIn profile and do you know this person we're connected with on LinkedIn who maybe I do or got connected with them somehow, it comes off as creepy and trying too hard. You don't want my focus to be on some silly detail like, oh, you liked some silly blog I wrote a while ago. You want the focus to be on, hi, I'm so-and-so, I'm going to change your life. You should be begging to get on call with me. We, yeah. I need to see your self-respect. I need to see the fact that you're a worthy person that's reached out to me and I should be thanking you. Every single person you reach out to, if you've gotten your message right, you've gotten your profile right, should be thanking you for reaching out because you're generally there to help them. When you grovel, when you focus too much on the wrong things, it tells me you're swindling me. Yeah, oh, man. I so love I got to follow up on that on Michael because that's actually, you touched on a pit that I totally forgot about. Yeah, no, 100% right. Um, the, the choice of language that people use, you have to be so careful of being, being apologetic. Uh, the second you say you, you like my, like Michael saying, the second you ask for like you, you apologize for, for messaging someone. Hey, I know I messaged you last week, but bother you loser. Yeah. It sounds, it just sounds so <laughs> worthless. It sounds like, why are we even having this conversation? If you're not going to yeah. bring me value, which I think is what it goes back to. And, um, you know, it, it, it's so important to make sure that, that you're conveying that confidence if I think I, I don't know who said this, but if you thought about the fact that w if your product is bringing true value to someone, right? If your product is bringing true value to someone, uh, and let's say you had a million dollars in your hand and you could give that million dollars out to anybody, right? You would not have any issues emailing someone saying, "Hey, can I give you a million dollars?" Calling someone, "Hey, can you give me give you a million dollars?" People will be thanking you to have that conversation, right? Oh, of course, I want to have a conversation with you about giving me a million dollars. The same is true for your product or service. If you've got something of quality and you're bringing people true value, they'll be thanking you for reaching out to them. Uh, so make sure that you're confident in what you're doing and people will be a lot more receptive to it. Yeah, that makes so, that makes so much sense. Well, we've got some more questions to jump into. I, I, I wanted to pile on as well, though, just, just super quick. I had a guy walk up to me right here in our neighborhood. He's like, hello, my friend. And he said it's in such a friendly way and it should have worked, but it kind of pissed me off. Cause I'm like, I don't know you dude. <laughs> like we're not friends. Not yet. Anyway, I don't know. It really rubbed me the wrong way. If you would have used the same tone and said something like, Hey, I don't want to bother you, but I got something really cool. Can I hit you with it really fast? You can tell me if it's interesting. Like he would have approached me like really confident, but the confidence was great, but it was still kind of creepy that he was trying to be too much. My friend. So maybe that's, maybe that kind of balances the whole thing, right? You could overdo the confidence thing too with, uh, with creep. So there is a sweet spot for sure. Uh, here's a question from a, a LinkedIn user. 
on, uh, and I think, let's see, is it Pamela? I don't know. But the question is, which way are you finding you're getting the best and fastest engagement in terms of these different outreach channels? Email, LinkedIn, phone calls. Do you guys have preferences on that? Yes, I definitely have preferences. They're all important, but your success with them are going to vary based on your industry and how available the data is. The most readily available data and responses are going to come from email. Uh, the, the reason for that is because people are living in their email inboxes. They directly feel pain when their email boxes get too filled up. And so people are, are, are living and dying based on that. When it comes to LinkedIn, LinkedIn has done everything it can to prevent it from being a quality sales channel anymore. You know, it, mm. it is still a great sales channel, but LinkedIn is much more of a, a content engine, a social network. There are restrictions on how many co connection requests you can send and how many emails you can send. LinkedIn is a really good backup for email. It's great to run the to run campaigns in parallel because if someone if you're doing that, you're probably more likely to get more responses specifically over email. Mm. Cold calling is uh, by far the most hit or miss. Uh, it's uh, the hardest to get the best data on. We normally find that it's common to get data on about 30% of the contacts we're running email and LinkedIn campaigns on. And uh, it's also not always clear based on industry whether people are going to answer the phone. There are different types of databases and tools you can use to cross-reference it to know who's a, a much uh, who's much more likely to answer the phone. But mm -hmm. when you get, it's kind of like this. When you get a lead from cold calling, it's the most high quality lead. It's the best lead there is, but you're not doing that for volume. Email yeah. is usually for volume. LinkedIn's for branding. Okay. Yeah, I'll follow that makes a lot of sense. Well, I think there's a difference between when you say best and fastest. So if you want to talk about like best for lead generation at scale, that's email usually. Um, uh, well, to be fair, you have inbound as well, like PPC, paid advertising, that, that can be really, that could, that could be the best uh, for scale depending on your budget. If you want to talk about fastest, um, I don't think there's anything really faster than getting someone on a phone call. You might have to call a lot of people, but once you actually have someone there, if you're a good cold caller, that's the fastest. Um, you might have to call a lot of people before you're able to get that person on the line though. And I think LinkedIn is actually really valuable when it comes to account-based marketing. Like what is your, what is your go-to-market strategy? Do you have a huge total addressable market? Like your, your TAM is huge. Then let's do email. Let's do, let's do cold calling. Let's do that. But do I have a really, if I have a really tight uh, total addressable market, it's not that broad, but it's high value. And that, then I've got like 200, 300 companies I can work with. LinkedIn actually might be your best bet, right? Trying to develop those, real relationships with people, sort of the longer social route, building a brand and sort of taking that much more nurtured process, uh, that could be your best channel. So I think it really depends on what your goals are, what your go-to-market strategy is, and what that looks like for you, which channel is going to work best. Do you guys, uh, do you guys have, have feelings about some of the companies that focus on getting you cell phones? Uh, are there, is there promise and peril there? Or what are your thoughts? What's the question exactly? Can you repeat that? Well, there, so you can get data lists where they're focusing on getting the mobile phone numbers. So they oh. are going to be, and I know that's changed too, even just very recently with some of the scam uh, detecting software. Now, even on my own phone, like scam likely pops up. So I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on that Mo mobile focused uh, data when it comes to the phone piece? I think the first thing we need is to make sure you also have do not call lists. You need to cross-reference your phone data with really not calling people who are on those lists, okay? Mm -hmm. It's going to be kind of a waste of time. It is spam. They've specifically asked. The whole point is we're not trying to bug people. We're not trying to spam. We're trying to form good relationships. So yeah. some people are just <coughs> on the phone. You can send one person 10 emails, 10 cold emails, and they're going to thank you on the 10th. And one person on the first email is going to mark you as spam or, you know, hate your guts. Um, right. I definitely think that all of this requires a lot of data cross-checking. For all the lead research you do, there's lots of great databases and there's a lot, but those databases are not where you stop. You've got to take those databases and then manually go through all of the prospects to make sure that the data is verified, they meet your highly customized profile. And that's why the lead research aspect is really probably the most time consuming. It's the most time consuming, the most labor intensive. So it's good to get those phone numbers from those data sources, but you have to cross-reference them and... Uh, and, and, and really, really do your due diligence. Otherwise you can get in trouble. Quality, quality, quality it takes time, but worth the effort. Well, let's circle back then to more of a content content based question from Alfonso Gomez here, who is asking, once you have your long form pitch written down, 
what do you consider to start kind of eliminating sentences and paragraphs and get this thing kind of pared down? That's an issue I have, but I'm copywriting. I always start with way more, right? And then it's about trying to pare it down. Can you give us some recommendations on best practices in that vein? Sure. Who was it that said I apologize for writing so long I didn't have enough time to write a sort of letter? I, I don't remember who yeah. said that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think that's a huge challenge, Alfonso. Like actually creating concise and, and tight messaging is super challenging. I think one of the first things to do is look over everything you've written and start killing anything that sounds like buzz. Any buzzwords that don't actually mean anything. People love them. They're garbage. They just fill up space. Kill them now. The next thing to consider is what things am I saying here that are intrinsically understandable that I can just say one word and everybody gets it? And what things here are actually like niche language or brand specific language that I need to define? Um, and then how much do I actually want to, how much time or space, how many words do I actually want to spend dealing with those topics? And is it better to just skirt around them or give them full attention? Are they, are they core to my value? Um, a lot of people get caught in the buzz thing and a lot of people will get caught, uh, saying things that they think are understandable and they're not. So, so first consider those two aspects. Uh, and then look for anything that you've said, you know, in, with four, five, six, seven words that could be said with two. Um, also, I would say make sure that you're using language that is, uh, you know, what, like eighth grade level. Y you want to avoid any sort of large words, even if you're verbose and loquacious and you have this enormous vocabulary, forget about it, right? Uh, if you have a big word that can be, you know, if you have a, a word of seven letters that can uh, be replaced with the word with three, go with the word that's three letters long, like you simplify everything. And again, on, you might also write down what is your core value? Like what is the core value, the core thing that you want someone to understand? And that anything in all that messaging that's not related to that, kill it dead and try to boil it down to that core value and then just start whittling away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I like that. My uh, my daughters are both uh, studying, uh, uh, taking film studies in university at this time, and they talk in editing of movies about killing your baby, <laughs> which sounds a little harsh. But you'll you know if if it's your if it's your creation, you can fall in love with certain scenes or certain uh, portions. But when you realize that the whole is better served without that part, you just got to cut it off kind of mercilessly. But Michael, would you agree with that? Would you say more on this process? I, I would say that, you know, uh, Alfonso brings up a great point. Now, Alfonso, if you want, you can always contact us directly and we'll send you our our whole framework for creating email copy. Uh, we have like a, a kind of like a, a document we have. We recommend it's kind of a guideline of best practices to follow. I always recommend starting that long, say what you want to say, and then taking like a, a few hours or a day to kind of go back and review it because how it's going to look in a couple of hours is different from how it looks now. I recommend having a colleague, maybe someone at the company, read it for you, help you edit it. And probably the most important person I'd recommend uh, helping you explain what you're trying, what you're trying to sell in really simple language is actually a technical member of your team. Developers, software developers or product specialists are really underrated salespeople. They're not salespeople by nature because they're usually not, maybe not as outgoing or they don't want to be in front of people, but they're used to trying to explain the details of what's going on in really simple language. And so having a developer really help align your language with them can be really useful. I'd be very, very careful about short sentences and also not having long paragraphs. Each paragraph should be no more than two sentences before another space. Okay. The calls to action should be in a separate line by itself. Okay. Because you're, uh, you're, you're, you're writing something that's going to get a quick glance. And you don't want to have bulky paragraphs. Okay. And the biggest thing I would say is the following. If you really look yourself in the mirror and you have no idea what your CEO, your CTO said. You don't really know all the intricacies because a lot of times when people write these messages, especially salespeople and marketers, they're parroting what they think they heard from their boss because they want to make a good impression and they think it kind of makes sense. And they assume that using this buzzwordy language is going to get the job done. The problem is that even if someone on their side is super technical and really understands your niche, the way you write it at 3 a.m. or 7 a.m. or when they're on the train, everyone's capacity to understand Go, it goes down, goes down the toilet. And so that's why you need, you're writing for an eighth grade level, hoping that that 35 year old man or woman will, will, will be able to spare some attention to try and understand it. So I would definitely get other people's feedback. I would uh, have short paragraphs, 
a, a lot of white space in, in the messaging. And most importantly, and, and unfortunately, have very few links because those links are going to send you to spam. Well, for sure. Well, gentlemen, it's been a great conversation today. I want to thank you for giving such great, actionable, high value content to the listener today and, and for being such fantastic guests in the show. Jonathan, it's been a great, it's been a pleasure being here. It's been real fun. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and we'll plan to have you guys back in the future, I trust. Well, I want to thank our live audience as well for being here on LinkedIn and for all of our wonderful many listeners that are making the show such a success. Uh, we give you our thanks for continuing to, continuing to help us grow at a very rapid pace. If you're enjoying the content each week, you can check out all of our past guests by going to the Evolve Sales Leader, wherever you like to go and find your favorite podcast to download, listen to while you're working out, spend a little time behind the windshield or where, what have you. Uh, the Evolve Sales Leader has a growing library of thought leaders across the whole range of business building insights that are cutting edge and up to date in this post-COVID era. Well, and we also want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Overpass, the leading platform for getting talent to grow your, your company fast. It's a global workforce, but it's cutting edge talent from anywhere in the world. You can hire quickly a team of SDRs, AEs, full cycle sales reps, people to work your telephones and help you grow your business in any capacity. It's free to set up your account. Go to overpass.com and check them out today. Well, that's going to do it. Once again, I'm Jonathan Fisher. Thanking you for being here. We'll see you next time. Take care, everybody. Hey.